how do we classify interstitial lung disease and how do we detect connective tissue disease in IRD. That's, those are very challenging fields and I think you, most of you, you are experts, some of you are more expert than I am and so it will be challenging but nonetheless I would like to discuss with you this issue and please interrupt me at any time if you disagree or if you want to add something because I think we can make the best of this afternoon if we interact at the maximum. So you are very familiar with these slides. I think I presented this slide probably a hundred times all over the world and this is the classification of interstitial lung disease as made by ATS ERNs more than 10 years ago. So is this still something which is uh, contemporary or useful in clinical practice? I think so, yes, in particular if you look to some established entities. This box, exposure related disease, I mean there is no question, they are not going to change that much over time. The same is for sarcoid, the same is for disease entities. This we'll be talking about later, but this is the real black hole in this classification. Idiopathic interstitial pneumonia, what we, huh? what we mean about that? Which is the approach to the IRD patient? So this is my approach to the IRD patient. It can be different from your approach to the IRD patient. And I'd like to discuss this with you, maybe not with Professor Cordier, which is too much an expert of this, so I don't want to, I don't want to answer a question from him. But for anyone else, yes. So first, of course, you need to know about IRD. You need to learn, you need to study, you need to read. And to know that IRD is an entity and is a complicated entity. Then you take a history of your patient, lung function, and high resolution CT scan. That's, I think it's the minimum set of diagnostic tools that we need to make a diagnosis of IPS or of interstitial lung disease. And in many instances, you get the diagnosis after you take a detailed history, lung function, and high resolution CT scan. So this morning we have seen the case of IPF, but there are many others. All the occupational exposure related ILD, it's a mixture of history, lung function, and high resolution CT scan. Sarcoid, most of the cases, they might be diagnosed even before BL. IPF, we have seen that 50 to 60 percent of patients they will get diagnosed before lung biopsy and lung and cell histocytosis or LEM, they have typical appearance and typical feature at high resolution CT scan, you'll make the diagnosis at this stage. But in a fraction of this disease, this part is not enough. That means that you need to ask yourself, do I need bronchoscopy? or it is possible that this patient has a non-obvious connective tissue disease. And these, I think, are two critical questions to ask yourself. Bronchoscopy, which are the use of bronchoscopy? To rule out or to diagnose occult infection, to diagnose sarcoidosis with transbronchial biopsy or bronchial viola lavage or a combination of the two. To evaluate the differential cell count for hypertensity pneumonitis, eosinophilic pneumonia. This is mainly common practice in Europe. It's not used that much in the US or the rest of the world. Diagnosis IPF by bronchoscopy, I don't think is feasible for the reason that we explored this morning. But some people, they think that bronchoscopy that can be supportive of a diagnosis of IPF. So it's clear that bronchoscopy needs to be performed at least in a fraction of these patients. And in a fraction of these patients, you need to do bronchial viola lavage. And I want to underscore how it's important for a pulmonologist to have a reliable reading of bronchial viola lavage results. 
you need to know which cells are there, the numbers, the characteristics, the phenotype, the proteins, and so on and so on. Now we go at CTD. CTD, they will be the talk, the next talk. I'm sorry, it will be short. What to send to diagnose a connective tissue disease is completely unclear. And even in the IPF guideline, it's not explicit. They just tell you, you test for the possibility of a connective tissue disease. What we do, usually we test for RF and CCP for rheumatoid arthritis. And a test, very non-specific at low titers. SSA, SSB for the Sjogren. JO1, CPK aldolase for myositis. RNP for mixed connective tissue disease. SCL70 for scleroderma. But we know that connective tissue disease may present without extrapulmonary manifestation. So you can be in the presence of a patient with only pulmonary involvement and still have connective tissue disease. And that's a very critical and difficult point that we'll address in the next talk. But let's say that you make a diagnosis of sarcoid by transbronchial biopsy or a diagnosis of, uh, let's say, Sjogren by serology, then you get the diagnosis. But this is not happening very often. In many cases, you don't have a diagnosis here, then you go to surgical lung biopsy. So surgical lung biopsies in ILD is not like surgical lung biopsy in cancer, in which you have a definite answer to your questions. Surgical lung biopsy in ILD can still be questionable. There is a lot of variability and inter-observer variability among pathologists. And the technique used to sample the lung of these patients, it makes a difference too. What we learned about interstitial lung disease, that is smoking, is the major factor for risk and also for categorization of this disease. Why is that? Because smoking is a major risk factor for many diseases, including lung disorders. Of course, emphysema, of course, lung cancer, of course, ILD. Just to remind you the importance of smoking, this is a very recent paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine by Richard Pito. You remember Pito, Pito and Fletcher, the curve on COPD change over time. You remember that? Good. And uh, they published this important paper. And this important paper is actually showing that simply by not smoking, you gain 11 years if you are a woman and 12 years if you have a man. That's on average. That's a lot. I mean, that's the most convincing evidence to me for not smoking. It depends. If you like your life, you don't like your life. <laughs> you know, If you have a horrible wife, you don't like your life, you don't want to live for 10 more years. But at the same time, if you like your life, you enjoy living, you know, just by not smoking or smoking, on average, the difference between a camera smoker and a never smoker is 12 years for a man and 11 years for a woman, which is a lot. It's really a lot. And this is uh, another fantastic study, I think. You know, UK, the British are good for epidemiology, basically, <laughs> not more else. But they are very good for epidemiology. And they did this study, which is a prospective study on one million women in the UK. That means something, right? <laughs> and they showed very clearly, when you get the numbers to show this, that cigarette per day, they correlate exactly with the expenses of life. And when you see a woman starting uh, at less than 15, 16 years of age, between 17 and 21, or more than 22, then the relative risk of dying, as compared to never smokers, it declined, but you never get back to never smokers. So again, smoking is such a powerful risk factor for any disease. Putting all together, that has a clear-cut effect on all of these disorders, including pulmonary fibrosis.
you know, smoking increased the risk of pulmonary fibrosis, but 1.53 times statistically significant. Of course, it's not the same risk as lung cancer or stuff, but still, there is a risk for these patients. So I think this is extremely important to know, and that's why I think it's, it's important to understand this. So come back to this classification, and these are all smoking-related ILD, as far as we know. Rheumatoid arthritis ILD, Langerhans-Sell hypercytosis, eosinophilic pneumonias, IPF, DAP, RBILD, they are all smoking related. So that means that even in the field of ILD, smoking has a prevalent and prominent role. That's why you already know this, but this is the new classification that has been proposed by JRU in this issue of clinical chest medicine for the smoking-related interstitial in Lyme disease. It's very interesting. It's very important, I think. They propose a new classification. This new classification is the following. There are chronic ILD that are very likely caused by cigarette smoking. So if you don't smoke, you don't get the disease. RBILD, respiratory bronchiolitis with interstitial lung disease, desquamative interstitial pneumonia, adult pulmonary lung and cell histiocytosis, and that's it. So, if you don't smoke, you don't get this disease. That means that it's extremely likely that these diseases are directly smo caused by smoking. Then the second category is acute ILD. You see the change here. We, need, we are talking about disease presenting acutely within few weeks or few days that might be precipitated by cigarette smoking. And this is not really recognized. And these entities are acute eosinophilic pneumonia, very dangerous, presenting in young smokers, pulmonary hemorrhage syndrome. Again, these can be precipitated by smoking within few days or few weeks by start of the smoking. Group three is what we think is more easily associated with smoking, which is ILD statistically more prevalent in smokers. That means they can be found in non-smokers, but smoking is still a risk factor. IPF is the prototype, but Rheumatoid arthritis associated ILD is the other one. And then you have the group four, which I think is, is it's very intriguing because it's never entered any classification. It is ILD less prevalent in smokers. So we could say that in this group four, smoking is protecting from getting the disease. And these are not surprisingly immune mediated disease because smoking is a local immunosuppressor. So you have two entities. The first one is HP, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, much less frequent in smoker than in non-smoker. And the second one is sarcoid. So this is the spectrum, I think, of the relationship between smoking and ILD, going from being a strong risk factor for having the disease to being a strong risk factor for protecting from having the disease. Now let's go to the major point of this talk. The major point of this talk is the classification of idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. Again, as I told you, it's a little bit of a black hole because they are idiopathic, they have been called like pneumonia, which is not exactly correct. And they have been classified in year 2002 by ATS with the collaboration of the ERS. But this classification was largely based on pathology. So both the ATS and the ERS recognized that there was a need to revise this classification. Because this classification was pathology based and was not practical for clinicians. That's why ATS and ERS started 
about uh, three years ago this process of reviewing that classification and there, there is an update of the international multidisciplinary consensus classification on IIP. You see how many people have been involved. We have more and more people on guidelines. That's because we, have, we want to have people from different parts of the world. You want to have pe people from different specialties. You want radiologists, you want pathologists, you want methodologists on that. So this was a very difficult and long process, but at the end, this classification is going to be published in the Blue Journal soon. And it's also based as the previous IPF classification on the grade methodology for evidence. We meet a couple of times. The last meeting was in Modena, which is my city, which is also the, which was also the city of the last meeting of IPF. I think they're coming back because of the food, but not because of me. And uh, the major uh, result of this exercise was the following. The gold standard for IIP, not only for IPF, is the multidisciplinary discussion between pulmonologists, radiologists, and pathologists, experience in the diagnosis of IRD. So this means that if you are not having a chat or if you're not discussing a case with your colleagues in the radiology department or in the pathology department if you have a biopsy, it's very unlikely that you are respecting the gold standard for the diagnosis of IIP these days. So the multidisciplinary diagnosis is the key point. And this is the classification, the new classification of IIP. It's a very pragmatic classification. And I think it's a major result. You know, the people there were a mix of different continent, different nationality, different background. But all of them, they want to have something which is practical in clinical terms. So we have major category. The first major category is the following. Major IIP. Major in terms of prevalence, epidemiology, and clinical impact. Of course, the first one is IPF. So IPF is the major player of the major IIP. The second one is idiopathic non-specific interstitial pneumonia. So you know, I think, I, probably you are aware that non-specific interstitial pneumonia was a provisional category in the previous classification. It was like the pathologies, they don't know what to do with this. They put in this category, it's called non-specific interstitial pneumonia. So it's, and, and in the guidelines, 2002, they wrote clearly, this is just provisional, it's going to be changed soon. That never happened. Never happened. And now we know that INSAP, like IPF, is a distinct entity. So try to go behind the names, because the names are made by pathologists, and pathologists are just people spending all the day on the microscope. They are, they're not practical, right? But if you go behind the name, you see there is IPF and there is INSAP. I don't like NSAP, but the pathologists they don't want to change it, but still is an entity. It's idiopathic, nonspecific interstitial pneumonia. It's a diagnosis. RBILD, of course, is a major component of this group, and VIP. VIP is typical of smokers, as you know, is reversible, can be progressive, you know about that. Then, we have the major discussion about BOOP or COP. And you know, the Americans, they like the terms BOOP bronchiolitis obliterans with organized pneumonia. Why they like the term? Because it sounds, well, boop, right? Actually, it doesn't mean anything. On the other side, the UK expert, they like cop. So you, I think you may remind that the definition of IPF was cryptogenic fibrosing alveolitis in the UK. 
they like the term cryptogenic instead of idiopathic. So in order to get a balance between the UK and the US, we used idiopathic here, we use cryptogenic here. <laughs> Is there any difference between cryptogenic and idiopathic, Jean Francois? Very little. So that's, uh, that's why I ask you. Right. Right. Correct. So we end up with this COP, which is actually excluding BOOP. So BOOP is not anymore in the classification. And when you have an organizing pneumonia, which is very clear cut, it's very distinct pathogen uh, pathologic pictures in the surgical lung biopsy, if you don't find any cause for this, then you call it cryptogenic. AIP is a very rare entity. Still there are cases, but it's extremely rare, overwhelmingly rare. Most of the AIP, actually, they are exacerbation of IPF, unrecognized. So you see the practical and pragmatic approach, major and rare. Major means you are going to find this disease in your clinical practice almost daily. Red means probably they are patient you are not going to see. And you have idiopathic lymphoid interstitial pneumonia, idiopathic peripulmonary fibrolestosis, new entity described first in Japan, but now becoming more and more recognized. And then, this is a major advancement, I think. You have some IIP which are unclassifiable after lung biopsy. So if you have a patient discharged from your ward with a diagnosis of unclassifiable IIP, it doesn't mean that you are not able to make a diagnosis. It means they go into a category that we are not able yet to diagnose. Unclassifiable IIP now is an acceptable diagnosis for patient with interstitial idiopathic pneumonia. We discussed a lot on how to categorize this disease. And I think this, we used cartoon, we worked overnight, and that was a very interesting uh, exercise. You don't see this exactly, but you see that this is the prototype of the new classification. You know, actually, after IIP, there is not pathologic classification. There is clinical classification. It's chronic, smoking related, acute and subacute. And then you get the pathologic features. So the categorization is the, front, is the following. Three categories, chronic, smoking related, acute, subacute. This is the clinical radiological pathological diagnosis and this is what you find when you get a biopsy. But we want to make clear the point that the clinical behavior is what is driving your classification. It's not your finding of a pathology, but it's how the patient behaves. This is the first part of the major, the most important table in the document. We have different categories. You see, these new columns is clinical behavior. Treatment goal, monitoring strategy. So it's a pragmatic clinical approach. It's not made for pathologists. It's not made for radiologists. It's made for clinicians. Some disease are reversible and self-limited. Typical example are BILD. Patients stop smoking, they revert. The treatment goal is to remove the cause, stop smoking in this example. And in short term, three, six months, you confirm regression. IAP, they can regress. That's the first category, extremely important. Second category is reversible, yes, but with some risk of progression. 
typically an SAP, COP, or DAP. So initially, you look for a response, and then you need to rationalize long-term therapy. Short-term observation, confirmed response, they can improve, they, can, they will not revert completely, but long-term, you sure that the gains are preserved. They will not go back to the previous state, but still, they will improve. Most of the NSAP will be stable with residual disease. And your treatment goal so far is to maintain the status. They will not improve. You want to maintain the status and include long-term observation to assess disease course. And this is typical of most of idiopathic NSAP. Then the two other categories is progressive, irreversible, with potential for stabilization. These are the so-called fibrotic NSAP. You want to stabilize this patient with long-term observation and you get into the category of IPF, but also some NSAP. They will progress irreversible despite therapy. Your aim here is to slow progression, not to revert the disease, not to stabilize the disease. You want to slow the progression. That's a realistic treatment goal. And you do long-term observation to assess disease course and the need for transplant or effective palliation. So which is the summary of this new document? NSAP is now much better defined as an entity. It's not the bean, it's not the is not provisional, is a definite disease. Smoking-related ILD are an important part of IAP, but they are diagnosed without surgical lung biopsy. There was a lot of discussion, should, should smoking-related ILD be part of the idiopathic interstitial pneumonia if we know the cause, right? It's not idiopathic if you know that it's smoking-related. But at the same time, we decided to keep smoking related within this box. About 10 to 20 percent of your patient, you will not be able to classify them. This is something that you have to live with. Unclassifiable IIP is a diagnosis. So the classification based on disease behavior, it's very important because it is independent from pathology and is clinically relevant. The last recommendation of this document is that molecular markers should be investigated to promote to help diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment. So Bill Travis, who is pathologist in New York, he is the first author of the new guidelines on adenocarcinoma. He was very convinced that by translating molecular markers to IIP, we should be able to achieve results as in adenocarcinoma when we decide treatment strategy based on molecular markers. Are we there now? Maybe not, but this is where you should do, we should go. This is the lung adenocarcinoma classification. And if you take, if you have a patient with lung adenocarcinoma, there is no way that is not having all of these molecular fit, no? Should, maybe, we don't know. But in any case, there are target, molecular target that need to be investigated because some drugs will be effective, the prognosis will be different, and in the biopsy, you need to assess this. Are we there already with IIP? Not yet, but we're starting. We're starting. This is a paper from the group of David Schwartz in Denver. And he suggested, he showed actually that MAC5B, which is a gene involved in the production of mucin, is a strong predictor of IPF in smokers. So I think we are moving forward an era where molecular uh, testing will be more and more important. And I will leave you with this cartoon that is show you and stress the importance of molecular testing and genetics in daily life. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you, Luca, for this excellent review. Is there any questions? Yes, yes please. Thank you. Uh, can I ask about the difference between fibrotic uh, and ISP and uh, I IPF? Uh, you know there are a lot of similarities in the behavior and uh, histopathologic features. Yeah. The main difference is a pathology difference, and the main difference, if you if you if you discuss that with pathology, is that NSIP is a homogeneous disease, while IPF is a heterog UIP is a heterogeneous disease in terms of involvement. Uh, I have patients with this sort of fibrotic NSIP, they have the same behavior as IPF patients. So I think that we are in a, a field where you have gray zones and transition from one to each other. So it's very difficult to answer your question. That's why clinical behavior is what is important. So you have a patient with NSAP. You treat the patient with a short course of corticosteroid. If the patients improve, okay, that's a reversible IIP, and your treatment goal is completely different if the patient is keep deteriorating. So what I'm trying to tell you is that the pathology has a big role, but at the same time, what it matters is the clinical behavior of these patients. So if you ask me which is the difference between F, fibrotic and SAP and IPF, UAP, if I'm a pathology, I'm telling you there is a huge difference. If I'm a clinician, I'm telling you there is no real difference, in fact. Thank you, Professor. A practical uh, question that we face a lot of times, you did mention in that category the uh, identifiable causes, drugs, for example. Right. We get faced a lot of times by consultations from the cardiologist telling us, we think this guy has interstitial lung disease that's amiodarone induced. Right. And the problem is, how can you confirm? Yep. Because if you, even if you take a biopsy, the changes are going to be, even in a patient that's not, not specific. toxic. Yep. Right, exactly. So how do you com confidently make the diagnosis and tell them, no, it's not the case? That's extremely difficult. If you look, uh, if you look, the, the, the French colleagues, they have this uh, uh, pneumotox website in which they update every single report of one single case, maybe related to one single drug. So that you ends up, I, I do that all the time with my fellows. You have a patient in front of you with interstitial lung disease. This patient is 65. He takes at least four or five drugs. You put one of these drugs into pneumotox, you tell it, yes, there has been a report <laughs> from Korea showing that you have some. Now, the cause effect is very difficult to show. And, but at the same time, some drugs, they are clearly related to interstitial lung disease. So some of them, at least, they need to be taken into account and be discontinued to see if there is the cause. Yeah, with the Miodarone, I was under the impression, I, my, that's one of the tips that one of my, one of my professors taught me, that uh, if you do a CT scan yep. without contrast on yep. those patients and yep. it does light up, that may be a clue that it is a Miodarone induced. Because Even BL can be helpful, right? I'm looking at Jean-François because he has much more experience than me. I mean, in sometimes in, in BL uh, fluid, you can find typical features of amiodarone-induced lung disorder. But the real point is that in any case, drug-induced ILD will always be based on your hypothetical link between the drug and the disease. point to uh, give credit for the North Americans uh, when they classify BOOP as BOOP. They basically, they are describing the pathology, bronchiolitis operation. My question is, whether it's BOOP or cryptogenic or whatever it is, wouldn't it be easier to classify them as, from the practical point, as steroid responsive versus steroid unresponsive? This is one thing that has been discussed. But if you look at the classification, the fact they are responsive or reversible, they're reversible after steroids, actually. So it's not written in the document, really, <coughs> but it's what it happened, right? So that's it. So they are steroid responsive or non-steroid responsive. So 
that's exactly what, what, what it means. And, but there are two critical information here. One, you need to assess the effect of your treatment early. Everything is three, six months. Second, it makes no sense you have to avoid to keep going on chronic corticosteroid treatments if patients are not responding. I don't know which is your experience, but my experience in, in, in Italy is that patient, they keep going on corticosteroids for years without any evidence of response, just because it's the only available option. This is something that the new guidelines strongly recommend against doing. 